Uh, to introduce our next two speakers, uh, we have Adam Ralph and Connor Ostov. Uh, Adam Ralph is a team manager working in incident response and forensics at a large regional healthcare company. Uh, previously, he's worked at a managed uh, security services provider, Solutionary, uh, now NTT Security, as well as CERT. Adam holds a Master's of Science in Information Security and Insurance from Carnegie Mellon University and a Bachelor's in Communications and a minor in mis er, Music from University of Pittsburgh. Currently holds his Security Plus from CompTIA, uh, GCIH certification from SANS, and is working on his CISSP. In his spare time, Adam enjoys playing music uh, in odd time signatures, obsessively discussing the nuances of flavors in food and craft beer and whiskey, and spending too much money on Steam sales. Several of these I can relate to. Uh, Connor Ostov is a senior incident response analyst uh, with a strong background in healthcare and finance. He possesses a proven track record of responding to compromises of all shapes and sizes. Uh, he is an avid hiker and automo er, automobile enthusiast uh, and finds enjoyment in difficult challenges both inside the office and outside of it. Uh, Connor currently holds uh, GIAC Certified Forensic Analyst uh, Certification and GIAC uh, Mobile Dev Analyst or Device Analyst Certification as well. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and hand things over to you guys and go ahead and get started. Good morning. Thank you, Zach, for the introduction. Um, so I guess we can actually go right into the talk and skip probably the introduction slide because we already got that information. But I'm Adam Rofe. Uh, this is Connor Ostoff. We're giving our talk here on picking up the pieces, which is incident response for third party compromise. Um, so s this is some of the stuff you guys already know. So we're just going to move on from there. Uh, the legal mumbo jumbo, of course, the opinions expressed by us this morning do not necessarily express the views and thoughts of our employer, et cetera, et cetera. I think we've all kind of been through this in every presentation. Definitely familiar. So the scope, why are you here today? It's probably because you work in security to some capacity. You find yourself as an information security analyst and you respond to breaches, you work data breaches, things of that nature. Or you are a privacy legal official who is worried about that sort of thing, and as I think they all are. You may handle data that comes into your organization and you want to secure it as well. If you're worried about how individuals working with your data are actually treating your data, then this talk is for you as well. So um, we're going to make this a little bit more interactive, right, um, in talking to many of you who work in security in different capacities. Um, you guys can just shout out a couple of things. What are some of the first things you do whenever you find out that there's an incident in your network? Take it off the network. Anyone else? We Panic? Okay, that's, I like that that's one. not bad. No. We do that. What was that? Yep, so what's that? Call your chain of command, that's good. Yes, imperative. So we'll talk through some of the things that we've seen as a first party and then kind of talk through what you do as a third party, right? So a lot of you are probably familiar with the sans pickerel model. Um, this is one that a lot of uh, organizations have adopted, looking at preparation, preparing for any type of incident that comes into your organization, identifying the incident as it comes in, containing it, eradicating it, recovery, and most importantly, and it's usually skipped over, is lessons learned, um, having those after action reports. You probably review your logs. You're looking at firewall logs, proxy logs, AV, EDR if you have it, system logs, DLP, mail gateway, if you have an IDS or IPS. And I think Jay touched on this earlier, but training and communications. So if you need to reach out to your CSERT, if you have a particular chain of command you're going to follow. Um, in a lot of cases, even in our, in our environment, we usually reach out to privacy because we like to make them aware of any incident in case it has privacy leanings. You might reach out to your legal counsel, um, HR or ER, depending on you know, what the type of scenario is. You'll probably talk to somebody within the disaster recovery space or within corporate resilience, and there's probably even more than that. In my place of employment, we use the Pickerel model in a sort of forked variant. So to start things off, we have the discover phase. That's the point in time where the event is generated. 
the work is assigned to the appropriate parties and the escalation occurs if it is needed. In the investigation and scoping phase, the second one that we have here, our event monitoring team spends about an hour's worth of time to triage the event, gather different feelings on the types of data that are associated with it, and try to build a case from that. If a true positive is identified, then escalation occurs at that point as well. It is logged within the incident response ticketing platform, and an escalation to the incident response and forensics team occurs at this phase as well. Communication with privacy, if needed, also happens. If there is a cybersecurity incident with a privacy implication, we absolutely want to have them involved. And lastly, for this phase, we hold in what we call an IRT meeting. So an incident response team meeting kind of gathers all the people from CSERT, get them all together, have everybody on the same page, and progress from that point. So after we discover the incident, we understand the full scope of the incident. We've made sure that we're not missing anything. We begin working on containment. So we analyze the criteria for containment. We start to build our containment plan. And then after we determine a plan, we have the necessary sign-offs, we implement that containment plan. Once it has been implemented, we verify the effectiveness, and we make sure that we're not seeing the same types of activity. In the eradication and mitigation phase, which is the next one here, we plan and execute our remediation actions. We determine all activities. We assign all of the appropriate resources to those activities and the appropriate communications happen here as well. The impacts of the eradication and mitigation plan are assessed and the effectiveness is evaluated. If we find that we have implemented this plan and we still do not have uh, full remediation, then we go ahead and uh, reorganize our plan to keep those gaps in mind. Afterwards, the recovery phase. So if the eradication and mitigation phase cause any issues, we work diligently to restore normal business operations, and that's likewise for the implications of the cyber incident itself. We generate an incident report and deliver that report to the necessary individuals, and we change the incident to closure status. And lastly here we have the follow-up phase where we identify and review our lessons learned. We begin long-term corrective action and kind of keep all of those things in mind moving forward pick those gaps out and make sure that we're not susceptible to them again in the future. Okay, so here are some of the don'ts of a first party incident. So if you're the organization that suffers the incident or you happen to be the third party of an organization that you handle first party for, um, one of the first things is you don't ever lie to your customers. Um, if you have work to do, if you need to figure out what's going on, um, don't tell people that you're going to have everything resolved within a couple of days if you need a week to figure it out. Um, don't trust the assurances you receive from criminals. Um, there are many cases where things like ransomware have hit organizations and what they go back and say is, well, if I pay the ransom, they'll give me my data back, right? Um, in a lot of cases, that doesn't occur. Connor will talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, don't promise upfront answers to your customers if you can't deliver. So once again, if you say that you know, we'll have all systems restored within the next 24 hours and it takes 25 hours, that first hour right afterward, your customers are going to say, these guys lied to me. And it's going to ruin the faith in your organization. Finally, don't blame one person for an organizational-wide failure. Um, if there's an issue that occurs, a compromise that occurs within your organization, go back and actually take a look at is this a people problem? Is this a process problem? Is this a documentation problem? Is it training? Is it any, any of those things? Because yes, we are always going to have a weak link with, with humans, OSI layer A, right? But at the end of the day, if something else caused it and caused that person to make the mistake, try to go back and understand the root cause. And that's a big part of the lessons learned piece. On the topic of assurances from criminals, I think this incident is familiar to most of us. We've seen it in 2016. It was not fully reported until the end of 2017. It was a, it was a large company by the name of Uber, and about 57 million records, if I'm remembering correctly. The implications of this are the threat actor had this data, reached out to the organization, and essentially said, hey, I have this. What are we going to do about it? So they think through different plans. What can we do? and they decide that they'll turn it into a ransomware case. They will bribe the attacker and we'll, we'll pay you $100,000 if you keep quiet and then let us know that we don't have anything to worry about. So they did such actions. They took faith in the assurances that the criminals or the attackers had provided them and this fee was paid. Seeing as it made its way to headlines, it's, I think it speaks for itself. So going on to how to handle a third party incident, 
I think the things on the slide here, we've all probably tried it at some points in time, caving to our own frustration, but if your experiences are anything like mine, they don't tend to help you very much. So we'll go into a few things in detail of how we can respond to these types of problems. So the first step is prevention. You can't fall for a phishing scam if you don't check your email. You can't have a third party compromise if you don't work with any third parties. So let's just stop working with third parties altogether. That'd be a good idea, right? Well, the world's not like that anymore with the way that people are moving into cloud, the way that people are outsourcing some of their work, we can't really do that. And so a big part of that is trust. Um, so we are at this point trusting people we pay to do a job cheaper out of house, which means they're going to cut corners. Um, in a couple of the cases as we get later on to the horror stories is that we've met with many third party organizations where we ask them for their security folks and they don't have any. It's usually one person who works probably you know, 70, 80 hours a week doing all of the IT work as well as having to do security. Um, so when an incident occurs, they are totally burned out and oftentimes they don't have anybody on retainer. Um, so that's you know, unfortunate and we see that with a lot of organizations. Uh, another thing to think about is putting as much distance as you can between you and your vendors and third parties. So if they have connections into your network, um, 2FA or MFA, um, definitely a good idea. Limited access, so principal of least privilege. Um, we see a lot of cases where vendors will have admin access or direct RDP access to devices. Um, they're not segmented, they're not on a VLAN. Um, so network segmentation tying into that. And then the other important part is logging everything within that network. Um, we've seen a case where there was a fire alarm system that was compromised and there were no logs of that fire alarm system. So those are the kinds of things that you want to be on the lookout for. And one other thing to think about is that vendors and third parties will often have multiple clients. So in short, they care about you just as much as they care about their 400 other people. When responding to third party compromise, communication is imperative. You need to ensure that all internal members of CSERT understand their role. So while the media relations team is comfortable working with privacy and legal, they might not necessarily have the needs of corporate resiliency in mind, and they might not necessarily understand all of the implications of the cyber attack so that they can convey it. For a lot of these people who may be spelled out in your cyber incident response plan, they understand their roles and responsibilities on paper. Acting them out in person is a completely different story. Usually we find that for a lot of smaller organizations, especially whenever there is a breach that needs to be disclosed, this is often the first time that any of them are even in the same room talking about it. So if you already have one very large fire, it's better to have the fine details and the finer points of communication worked out beforehand to make sure that you're not fanning those flames in the chaos that you create trying to start your response actions. If you have a contract with the third party, and I would assume that you do, it is definitely a good idea to work with your legal team and find out what you can leverage contractually. Anything that can give you extra power to make them do what you want, which is give you a comfortable feeling that the threat is contained and resolved and explain that you aren't willing to compromise. If they still have an active threat, if there's still an active breach on their network, take a very firm standpoint and explain that normal business operations will not be resumed until that threat is at least under control. All right, so moving on to the next section, this is gonna get a little bit on the drier side, but we actually developed an in-house third-party compromise checklist that we worked on. So Connor, um, John Wolfram, who's formerly on our team, and many others within our incident response space came up with, uh, with a good practice for us to follow every time we ask third parties for their data whenever a incident has occurred. So um, this is kind of the checklist that we use. You guys probably can adopt something very similar if you haven't in your, um, in your incident response plans, but um, we'll go through these a little bit in depth. Um, so the first thing we usually ask is on the left side, we start with requested items, and on the right side, we ask them to identify where they received it from, which will include the date of when the when they have the logs from, what kind of logs they gave us, and what platforms this touches. Um, so first we start with the evidence of alert detection. So we ask them for you know, standard AV, EDR, HIPS, IDS, IPS type logs. Um, any network forensics artifacts that they can share, so that might be NetFlow, web logs, PCAP, uh, firewall logs, firewall configs, email attachments. Um, all system change controls and configurations, so this often gets glossed over. Um, 
in, ter in terms of a lot of compromises, there are cases where it might be an access permissions issue of something of that sort, and if there's a change record that's associated with it, we should be able to try to trace, A, why did it happen, and B, when did it happen, to understand the entire scope and why the dwell time is as large as it is. We also look for any endpoint forensics artifacts, so this might be log files or evidence of ransomware or malware. And so in each of these sections, we also ask for any additional notes, attachments, um, if they can give the sender and how they transmitted this information to us, whether it's email, e-delivery, or some other method. Um, we also ask for evidence of vulnerability scans. So if they've done any recent vulnerability scans, and there are third parties and vendors who don't do vulnerability scans on any regular basis, but um, in the case that they do, we do ask them for this to identify the scope of the detection. Um, and then if they've got IOC scans that they can share with us, uh, we look forward to that as well. Any files that are modified by malware or ransomware or anything else are, a, are classified as a reportable breach under U.S. law. Due to those things, we ask for the following. Uh, DLP logs, so evidence that DLP is implemented and it was implemented at the time of the intrusion. Report evidence of any company data loss, so the company that you yourselves work for. Provide the criteria that was used to perform any DLP searches so that we can review that criteria and determine whether or not the, the uh, DLP logs have the integrity that we would expect. Malware identification. We ask for variance type, version, research data, and family so that we can understand all facets of the threat that we're currently facing on their behalf. We ask for forensic evidences, registry key changes, process hash, downloaded files, uh, command and control IPs and domains, installed locations, propagation techniques, the exploit that was used, and any other pertinent IOCs so that we can use those things to search for evidence of that malware operating in our environment. We also ask that attack vector and root cause be documented in terms of payload delivery, so documenting the appropriate evidence of that, showing the appropriate logs so that we understand the different phases throughout the, uh, the malware's point of infection, and also propagation, so document exactly how the infection spreads and how it did spread through their network. Moving along, we touch a little bit more on breach response, so asking them to provide evidence that no company data has been modified or exfiltrated, um, each infected host. Um, in some cases, that might come in as an attestation letter. Um, that's the opportunity for them to either attach that letter to it or speak directly to privacy teams, uh, legal teams. Um, we also look for evidences of a remediation plan. Um, we have a couple of areas for this. So one is to maybe at least give us the logs of the IOC scans that they have that would validate that they've wiped and removed the malware from the network. Um, we've run into cases where the vendor gave us the assurance that, yes, we've removed all threats from the network, only to be reinfected only weeks later. Um, we've also asked for documented mitigation plans. So this is to prevent future infection. This should be the, the problem management or the after action res reports that come out of this. Um, they should be giving us an understanding of why this happened, how they're going to prevent this from happening again. Um, so we also ask them for things, for example, if the compromise came because of an, un, you know, an unpatched system. We want evidence of what their patching schedule is and what they're using to patch that particular exploit. Um, vulnerability scans, so again, if they didn't have vulnerability scans in the past, we want them to begin a vulnerability scan program and tell us how often they're going to do it. Um, there's a lot of free and open source tools available, so it's not like they need to go and pay somebody to do it, but if they can't, that's also an opportunity for them to bring somebody in to do it. Um, we also ask for evidence that uh, the network protection stops propagation. So did they put in a VLAN? Did they do a layer three segmentation? Um, have they put any other steps in place um, to prevent the infection from hitting multiple systems and networks once again. Um, we also look for a modification of protection and detection vectors. So that, again, once again, looking for possibility of reinfection. So even if it got compromised via, you know, an open vulnerability in a POP3 server, what are you doing for that POP3 server? Um, and also what corrective action plans they're taking. So I mentioned earlier that you never really blame an organization-wide failure on one person. You should blame it on what's going on with the process, what's going on with the training, what was missed. So if it is something like phishing, okay, well, do you have a phishing uh, training plan in place? If it's something where somebody you know, accidentally set access permissions, okay, well, are you retraining that person on how that's done? Are you putting additional controls in? Are you putting in um, other technical controls to prevent that from happening in the future? 
On top of all the things that we've asked for so far, we ask that everything be included in an incident report so we can send out that incident report to all of the different members in CSERT who may work with the security representatives or the legal representatives of the third party compromise at a different capacity. A breach response notification, so the report that is provided to the privacy department, we have to make sure that that meets all legal requirements and also have our opportunity to feed data into that as well if the type of work that we do with that third party uh, requests such behavior and also to list agents scheduled to work on the audits requested in this document so that we have accountability for all of the things that were provided here. And if we have later follow-up activities, we know exactly who we can take those topics to. So I mentioned earlier about the networking logs. At this point, if they can provide us with the actual PCAPs or any of the actual log files, we do ask if they can include that. Um, ditto for IDS and IPS logs. So if they can give us evidence of the payloads that they've received, um, also for any of the signatures that they use to map this against, um, we request it at this time. Um, of course, the methodology for receiving this might not be something that's as simple as you know, adding it to an email. We might ask them to send it via something like e-delivery or SFTP. Um, patient zero monitoring. So again, we kind of go back to where did the actual infection occur and how did it occur? Can we look at, was this tied to a particular account? So if we look at the case of a phishing uh, incident, did they go back and reset the password for the account? Did they give the user training? Are they monitoring um, that account for more potential activity in case the actor remained persistent within the network? Um, what's going on with their email? Are there any other emails that are coming in? Are they harvesting credentials? Um, is there any strange web activity? So looking for things like C2, are there other malicious domains that the user is still connecting to, maybe unbeknownst to the user? Are there browser helper objects that are still remaining on the system? Um, a comprehensive review of that system as well as understanding if the endpoint itself is infected, what have they done to wipe and reload it? Are they doing you know, a nuke from orbit approach and just seven pass DBAN on it? Or are they just going to say, we're just gonna reinstall Windows and hope for the best? We want that evidence. Um, for the current AV status, um, we want to understand why the AV might have missed it. So if it was a particular compromise with a piece of malware, we might say, you know, what percentage of your hosts are currently loaded with the version of AV that you have? How accurate are the definitions and signatures? Are they recent? Um, do you still have a license for AV? We have run into cases where the vendor has um, had an expired AV contract. And so they hadn't had uh, AV updates for about a year. Um, is there proof of the ability to detect the future threats on the same signature? So if it's a particular piece of malware, once again, or a particular piece of ransomware, would your AV catch it the next time that this happens? My personal favorite part, the horror stories. We've all been there. The, uh, the things that we like to tell our friends after work, the, uh, the different things that we were playing the greats in our mind, they're very frustrating at the point in time where you're working through them, but afterwards they usually give you a good laugh. So to start this off, a uh, medical service vendor that we use to uh, some capacity is breached by ransomware. Now it's not the vendor that reaches out to us to tell us that piece of information. It is actually received by us through uh, different OSINT platforms, open source threat intelligence platforms. So we work through the data that we get, we reach out to the vendor through our privacy and legal team. We say we've, re we've received uh, an inclination that you have been breached by ransomware. So they say, mm, no, it didn't happen. Like, but well, we heard from a few different sources that it did happen. Public sources. Public sources, yes. Did it happen? No, it didn't happen. A couple of days go by, we start to see headlines on it. It has a pretty good bit of media attention. They still haven't issued any press release. At that point in time, they, they start to fess up. They start to tell their clients, yes, this happened. It's all completely under control. Don't worry about it. A few more days go by. We find out that it's not under control at all. It is actually spread through their entire network. It is completely painful. And once we finally reach a point where they're willing to be completely open and honest, they have nothing left to hide, we do find that they had incorrectly addressed the situation from the starting point. So they claimed that the attack had taken place over SMB. It was actually slow brute force RDP. So they got the infection vector wrong. Also, they claimed that this was a never before seen version of criminal ransomware, when in reality it was just commoditized SamSam. -Sam. Second here, a hospital chain is breached by ransomware. This is a, a hospital chain that we at Highmark work with to a pretty decent capacity. and. 
They report it to us. We ask them, okay, what are we dealing with? All they say is ransomware. Oh, how, how did it happen? To what capacity did it spread? Oh, we can't tell you that. Well, can we get any IOCs at all? No. Can we have any information? Can we have anything? No, we can't share anything. We also expect that you uh, restore that site-to-site -site VPN connectivity that you had removed at the start. But, sir, we can't do that if you still have an active breach on your network, regardless of the vector through which this spreads. Well, uh, you're going to have to. We're not going to provide you any information. That was pretty much the extent of that. We had a trusted third party that required forensic analysis. Um, they had a compromise. And so we reached out to them and asked them for the very things that we told you in our compromise checklist. Um, they reached back out to us and said, we don't have a security team. We don't know how to handle this. We need your help in trying to figure this out. So we said, sure, we'll take a stab at it. We'd be happy to help you out. And so we asked them to send logs. Um, they were unable to do that. Um, they said, how about we just send you guys the machines? Can you guys maybe do the forensics on it? And this is a uh, offshore vendor, right? So we reach back out to them and say, okay, yep, go ahead and send it to us. You know, make sure that it goes through customs, make sure that you have it signed for and everything. They agreed to mail us two of the machines that were infected. Um, one of them was lost in the mail. They did not buy insurance, and even the machine that came to us stateside did not require a signature. So it could have very well just been intercepted in the mail or lost or given up to anybody else. Um, we had a call center services vendor that was breached. Um, so when they had it, we actually found out about it um, kind of at phase three. They told us uh, about a week after they were actually initially infected. So at that point, we looked at it and said, well, usually this is kind of phase three of an infection. Um, so when did you guys actually get infected? And they said, oh, it happened on Saturday. It's just, that's when it happened. And we said, no, that's when you got hit with the ransomware piece. When did you actually get infected? Oh, no, it was Saturday. That's definitely that. And okay, well, do you guys have a security team that's going to take a look at it? No, but we have IT staff. Okay, so you have your IT staff take a look at it. Um, so what are you guys doing to prevent this from happening again? Oh, well, we already started uh, re-imaging the devices. Okay, well, did you do any backups? Did you take a look at you know, the forensic evidence? Oh, no, 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 we just wiped and reloaded it. We just figured we just try to get back to business as soon as possible. And so through our threat intelligence, we had determined that um, they got hit with a piece of ransomware that was part of stage three or phase three of the initial attack. So the initial attack actually happened probably about six days prior. Um, started at stage one, moved on to stage two, which was a dropper, and then stage three is where they actually got infected. Does anybody in the crowd have a horror story they want to share? I'd be happy to bring my mic down if uh, anybody's feeling confident. Come on, I know we all have one. No takers? All right, we'll move on. Okay, so I guess we actually wrapped up a little bit on the early side, unless anybody does want to indulge us with any of their particular horror stories. For sure. And we figured we'd also leave time up for Q&A. Yeah, there we Can go. Pass the mic, please. Sure. The best part with these is that these horror stories help us be better. So. Oh, sure. So the horror stories I recall, it's been a long, long time. How you doing, Ken? Um, is, uh, first I saw you. Uh, a certain ORT institution uh, was popped and an outside source told us that the institution had been popped and um, it took, and, and this was a nation state actor that had done this, and where's the speakers that I don't get feedback? Okay. Uh, nation state actor had gotten inside, we think, and contacted a certain three-letter organization, the FBI, and the corporation was going through a merger at the time, and it took us about a week to get a non-disclosure agreement in place with the FBI before we could come in and get the FBI to do the investigation. And uh, by then, you know, it, then by then the matter had kind of disappeared and people didn't really seem to care anymore. Is that horror enough for you, Adam? 
sort of, kind of. Does that make sense? I was trying to keep it, you know, not a lot of names involved. Sure, thank you. Any other takers? Last chance? Sure. Okay, uh, you were talking about collecting all the evidence after the breach. What are you doing in your contracts to make it so the vendor provides this information? Because I'm sure a lot of people don't want to share that information. It's confidential. And then once you get it, how are you protecting that information so that their information doesn't get disclosed? So I'll, I'll speak to this first and I'll let Connor come in after that. Sure. Um, one of the things that's happened because of all of these horror stories is that we've gone back to our contracting parts of the organization, our procurement area, and said that you know when we have these cases, this is the minimum that we expect from our vendors. Ditto for understanding for vulnerabilities. So as we see vulnerabilities within the organization, um, within their particular organizations, we ask them, you know, how often can we come back to you to make sure that you're doing this, that you are patching on a, on a reasonable basis? Um, I think the bigger challenge lies in medical device security because there are a lot of folks who probably work in healthcare who understand that the medical device space is a, a big challenge right now. Um, so what we've had to do in those cases where it's been a medical device vulnerability is having to go back to those particular vendors and saying, you know, hey, we know that you, know, you guys were able to mitigate this particular problem. But when this happens again, we want to be able to reach out to you and have competent staff that know how to handle this problem and that we want to have something actually built into our contract with you so that if you breach this, we actually will be able to you know, get you for a breach of contract. There is also the legal strong arm. So things at the end of the day, it all comes down to money. A company that's been breached, they're likely spending a whole lot of money trying to get their systems in pre-breach state. At that point in time, it's very convenient for our legal team to mention that we pay you X amount of dollars. If you're not willing to work with us on this, then I don't think we can provide you business in the future. So that's another option as well. Did that answer your question? Yeah, so I'll, I'll speak to it and I'll let you chime in here too. And I think Ken also had something right after this, but um, the question from Lisa was around, yes, that's what I was going to do, um, was around what do we do with the information that the third party provides to us? How do we keep that safe and how do we keep that um, kept under wraps? So, I mean, at this point when we receive the incident, we actually have an incident management platform that we keep our information in. And so we added as part of that case and we also added to the after action report. Um, that is only accessible by members of the incident response team and of our CSERT. Um, there's no one else who has access to that management platform to review that. Um, but when we do have items that we can share, we do have uh, meetings that we'll schedule with the various stakeholders to have those conversations to talk about here's where we have, you know, this is the information we receive from the vendor. Um, in cases where it's something like logs, we'll ask them to send it encrypted. Um, we have, you know, Zix to handle our encrypted mail as well as opportunities to do so by a SFTP and e-delivery uh, mechanisms to get that information. Do you want to add to that, Connor? No, I think you did a great job. Good. Ken? So, well, well, so I actually had a question about one of the uh, horror stories of yours. Uh, sure. the hospital chain. So you kind of trailed off there at the end of the story, but it sounded like that uh, discussion about restoring the site-to-site -site VPN may have climbed the ladder a few steps <laughs> before you came to some uh, agreement on a yay or nay for that. I'm just curious what sort of uh, preparation your management chain had and sort of uh, how that debate went and uh, how, how much traction you guys had with leadership and how that finally fell out? I would say that it was a losing battle from start to finish. Uh, we did have all the necessary parties on the line, and what it came down to at the end of the day is this is causing an impact to patient care. People can't come to our offices and get radiology IT services. You need to do this right now, and you have to put your best foot forward and believe that we've done the work that we say we've done. So it was not a very open and communicative process. Much further down the road, we did finally get all of the information that we were looking for. Also, I 
I think I believe that the person who was refusing to give us information is no longer with that organization, so. Oh, I didn't know that, but all right. Get it taken care of, sure. I work on the network team for a third party vendor. And in the incident that we have a, like an oopsie daisy and we have to provide these things, we have many customers data commingled in our logs. How sh do you manage it so that you can extract it out so you're not providing another breach whenever you provide those logs to uh, a specific customer? Uh, I would say that you guys probably have a challenge on your hands uh, when you have commingled data. Um, I would say that in those instances, do you have any of the customer data that you have within your organization segregated at all in any capacity? It's all commingled. Our databases are separated, but the application servers are all commingled together. Okay. Um, so that, I would say, is a hard problem. Um, what I would suggest is in those scenarios, if you can, um, the best way to do it is to, you know, be surgical about it. And I think the, the, the hardest part is one of the slides that I mentioned earlier out, don't lie to your customers, right? So if you are the third party that now has to deal with this breach that you now have to inform your customers about, don't tell them that you'll have the logs within a couple of days. In fact, I think they would appreciate the fact that you say, hey, you know, we're working on it. Let's have, you know, we'll give you a daily status update. I think just being more communicative than not at all um, will probably assuage a lot of fears that organizations have. I mean, I'm more willing to work with somebody who says, hey, I'm working on this and I'll give you an update every couple of days just to let you know how it's going versus I'll let you know whenever we're done or hey, I'll have this in 24 hours and they just not respond and not return that information. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And remember, the only limit is yourself.